Chapter 8 The Struggle for Swaraj The British did not respond to the constitutional agitation of the Indian National Congress in its early days. This clearly spelt out the limitations of the constitutional agitation. The extremist leaders such as Lokmanya Tilak in Maharashtra, Bipin Chandrapal and Aurobindo Ghosh in Bengal and Lala Lajpat Rai in the Punjab felt that the struggle against the British should be intensified further. The period from 1905 to 1920 is regarded as the extremist phase in the freedom struggle of India. Progress of the Extremist Politics Initially, the extremist leaders used the medium of newspapers, national festivals and national education to bring about the political awakening of the Indians. In addition to the newspapers Kesari and Maratha, Lokmanya Turk organized public celebrations of Ganesh Otsav and Shiv Jayanti. The purpose in organizing these national festivals was to bring people together, burying their mutual differences and to bring about national awakening in them. In those days, efforts were made through the Ganesh Otsav programs to bring about political awakening of the people. Lokmanya Turk put emphasis on making the people active in this regard. He wrote the Gita Rahasya with a view to explaining this Karma Yoga while he was in jail at Mandalay. The extremist leaders founded educational institutes in order to sow the seeds of nationalism in society. The purpose behind national education was to awaken a sense of pride for one's motherland. During the extremist phase, the national movement acquired a wider base. The extremist leaders were also successful in inculcating political ideas among the working class. The Partition of Bengal The province of Bengal was vast. Administratively, it was difficult to look after the affairs of this province. Therefore, the Viceroy Lord Curzon announced the partition of Bengal in 1905. He decided to partition Bengal by dividing it into a Muslim-majority East Bengal and a Hindu majority West Bengal. The reason given for this partition was administrative convenience. However, Curzon's real motive was to create a divide among the Hindus and the Muslims, thereby weakening the freedom struggle. The Anti-Partition Movement The people of Bengal were enraged by the partition of Bengal. The day of partition, 16th October, was observed as a national mourning day. Protest meetings were organized to condemn the government's decision. Vande Mataram was sung everywhere. The Raksha Bandhan program was organized as a mark of unity. Foreign goods were boycotted. Students boycotted government-run schools and colleges, thus joining the movement in large numbers. Educational institutions inspiring a national sentiment were established. This anti-partition movement was led by men like Surendranath Banerjee, Anand Mohan Bose, Rabindranath Tagore, etc. The anti-partition agitation widened the scope of the Indian national movement. Sensing the intensity of the movement, the British annulled the partition of Bengal in 1911. Servants of India Society Gopal Krishna Gokhale founded the Servants of India Society in 1905. Through the society, he aimed at arousing patriotism and thereby inculcating selflessness among the people. He also aimed at creating harmony by eradicating religious and caste differences. The society was founded also for the spread of education. While in England, Gokhale placed before the British people a picture of India's poverty and misery and also of the British oppression in India. The point program of the Indian National Congress Gokhale was the president of the Congress session of 1905. He justified the anti-partition movement. The Congress session of 1906 was presided over by Dadabhai Nauroji. In his presidential speech, he declared Swaraj to be the goal of the Indian National Congress. His message to the Indian people was, Remain united, attain Swaraj, and carry on ceaseless struggle for it. In this same session, the Indian National Congress unanimously adopted the four-point program of Swaraj, Swadeshi, Boycott 
and national education organization to solve the problems of workers. After the First World War, because of industrialization, the working class in India grew in size. This necessitated the formation of a nationwide organization of workers. The All India Trade Union Congress, AITUC, was founded out of this necessity in 1920. The labor leader N. M. Zoshi played a major role in the working of the AITUC. Lala Lajpat Rai was the president of the first session of the AITUC. He told the workers to actively participate in the national movement. Differences between the moderates and the extremists Differences had begun to arise in the Indian National Congress as to how to deal with the oppressive and unjust policies of the British. One group was of the opinion that even though the British had not fulfilled the demands of the National Congress, the Congress should carry on its work within the limits of law. They were known as the moderates. The other group thought that the British government would not pay heed to mere appeals or petitions. They wanted to intensify the struggle, to take it to the common people, to awaken the masses politically, to secure their participation in the national movement and to force the government to bow before public opinion. People in this group were called extremists. The moderates laid the foundation of the struggle for independence and the extremists took the movement further. The Surat Session These differences in the Indian National Congress reached a climax during the session of the Congress held at Surat in 1907. The moderates wanted to bypass their resolutions on Swadeshi and boycott. The extremists wanted to thwart this attempt of the moderates. This led to increasing tension at the session. It became impossible to arrive at a compromise. At last, the Indian National Congress split. The Oppressive Policy of the British The government became apprehensive due to the powerful anti-partition agitation of the people. In order to check the agitation, the government resorted to the policy of oppression. Acts were passed to ban public meetings. Those who violated the law were punished severely. Even school-going children were caned. Many restrictions were put on newspapers. Many printing presses were confiscated on charges of criticism against the government. Writers and editors were imprisoned. The government took very strong measures against the extremist leaders. Lokmanya Turk was charged with sedition and sent to Mandalay for a term of six years. Bipin Chandrapal was sent to jail and Lala Lajpatrai was deported from the Punjab. The Formation of the Muslim League The British rulers were disturbed by the overwhelming public response received by the Indian National Congress in the anti-partition agitation. Once again, the British resorted to the policy of divide and rule. Many British officers began to suggest that a separate political organization of the Muslims was needed to safeguard the interests of the Muslims. Encouraged by the British government, a delegation of upper-class Muslims led by Aga Khan met the Governor-General Lord Minto. With the encouragement of Lord Minto and other British officers, an organization called the Muslim League was formed in 1906. Prominent among the founders of the League were religious leaders like Aga Khan and landlords like Mohsin ul Mulk and Nawab Salim Ullah. The Act of 1909 the government passed an act in 1909. It is known as the Morley Minto Reform Act. This act provided for the inclusion of some elected Indian members in the legislature by increasing the number of Indian members in the legislature. At the same time, separate electorates were created for Muslims. Due to this divisive strategy of the British, seeds of separatist tendencies were sown in India. Unity among the Indians Lokmanya Turk returned to India in 1914 after a term of imprisonment. Thereafter, efforts began to reunite the moderates and the extremists. In 1916, both the factions in the Indian National Congress were reunited. In the same year, the Congress and the Muslim League came to a compromise at Lucknow. This is known as the Lucknow Pact. According to this pact, 
the Congress gave its consent to the separate electorates for the Muslims and the Muslim League agreed to cooperate with the Congress in its efforts to secure political rights for India. The Home Rule Movement The First World War in Europe broke out in August 1914. This war affected India also. The prices of items of daily need began to rise. The government imposed many restrictions on the citizens. Therefore, the discontent among the Indians began to grow. It was in these circumstances that Dr. Annie Besant and Lokmanya Tilak started the Home Rule Movement. Home Rule means self-rule, managing our own affairs ourselves. A Home Rule Movement had been launched in Ireland against colonialism. On similar lines, the Home Rule Movement in India asked the British government for the right to self-rule. Annie Besant and Lokmanya Tilak led whirlwind campaigns throughout the country to take the message of home rule to the people. Lokmanya Tilak firmly stated that Swaraj is my birthright and I will have it. The home rule movement lent a new vigor to the national movement. The Declaration of 1917 Against the background of the growing discontent in India, the growing popularity of the home rule movement and the state of war in Europe, the British government decided to grant some political rights to the Indians. Montag, the British Secretary of State for India, declared in 1917 that Britain would grant India, in a gradual manner, the right to self-rule and a responsible government. Lokmanya Tilak declared that if the British government thus showed sympathy and a considerate attitude towards the Indian demands, the Indians also would cooperate with the government. This policy of Lokmanya Tilak is called responsive cooperation. In 1919, the British Parliament passed an act with a view to introducing constitutional reforms. This act is known as the Montag Chemsford Act. The Montag Chemsford Act. According to this act, at the provincial level, some less important departments came to be transferred to Indian ministers. But important departments like finance, revenue and home affairs were in the hands of the governor. It was expected by all that the 1919 Act would lay the foundation of responsible government in India. But in reality, the Act was disappointing. Lokmanya Tilak criticized the Act saying that it was neither Swaraj nor its foundation. All Indians realized that a nationwide agitation was needed to compel the government to meet their demands. India prepared herself for the next phase of her struggle.